Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining me. This is our ninth and last message in our series on Elijah. Our passage today comes from 1 Kings 19, 9 through 15. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. The word of God to the people of God. Amen. Whispers. I find the wind annoys me. It causes trees to creak and rocks to crack, disturbing my thoughts and interrupting my meditations inhibiting access to my spirit. The walls around me sway as the rock gives way, trembling earth beneath my feet, dust and debris of an unfocused life caught in the grips of a struggling shrug. I step back from the fire, heat scorching my face, crackles and sparkles of burning embers flinging themselves through the air, bringing light without substance. And then comes the whisper, a soft voice calling me, without the snare of an oratorial air or bargain basement shenanigans, there is power in God's whispered secrets, shades of his phrases. Knowing the source of utterances in my ear, I cover my face to hide my disgrace and step with purposeful intent toward the whisper and the God and the presence of God. <clears throat> when I was a kid in South Dakota, I, I learned about world affairs. I remember the drills that we performed, duck and cover and hug the floor beneath the desks in our school. Living on an air base, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis well. I remember when my mother received that phone call from my dad, totally against regulations, that we, my mother, my sister, and me should go to the basement and not go back upstairs until he called again. Seven days. For seven days, we lived in our basement, only going upstairs to use the bathroom or grab some food. I did not understand the concept of global nuclear destruction. I only remember being fearful about something unseen. Those days still haunt me. As I write this message, the people of the world are once again stand on the brink of war. While we bicker over the border crisis, COVID, masking, vaccinations, racial discrimination, and the focus on police interactions, 
Russia has crossed the border into the Ukraine while shelling, nu shelling numerous cities marching towards Kiev diplomacy having failed. Once again, innocent people are dying while political leaders play chess. And while we feel that the conflict may be half a world away, there's a renewed fear that the world's superpowers, capable of destroying the world multiple times over, are once again at direct odds with each other. And with the world distracted by the events in the Ukraine, China stands by eyeing the gym known as Taiwan. I'm not saying that the border crisis, COVID, masking, vaccinations, racial discrimination, and the focus on police interactions are not important issues. Far from it. But there are times when we have to set aside our differences in order to deal with even bigger issues. The Ukraine is not a member of NATO at this time, but the escalation of U.S. involvement to protect NATO interests cannot be discounted. We remind ourselves of the words of Thomas Paine in his pamphlet, The Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. When we obtain what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. In another paragraph a little farther on, Payne writes, <clears throat> I have as little superstition in me as any living man, but my secret opinion has ever been, and still is, that God Almighty will not give up on a people to military destruction or leave them unsupportedly to perish, who have so earnestly and so repeatedly sought to avoid the calamities of war by every decent method which wisdom could invent. Neither have I so much of the infidel in me as to suppose that he has relinquished the government of the world and given us up to the care of devils. And Mr. Payne wrote those words on December 23, 1776. It's a central theme to each of us as Americans, although we often forget the source and the impetus of the circumstances that generated them. It is also important to us as Christians as we seek to protect our right to worship in a world turning in on itself. While God seeks to bring peace to our lives, the world seeks to drag us into war. And while God brings grace to our souls, the world seeks to corrupt us. And while God encourages us to live and care for his children, the world seeks to kill those children. And while God whispers to us, the world shouts at us. Have you ever noticed how when people are shouting us, shouting at us, we, we, we tend to stop listening? But when people whisper something to us, we draw closer to make sure that we hear what they have to say, even to the point of asking them to repeat it if we're una unable to understand something. There's something in our human nature that seeks to avoid people who are loud and boisterous. Not only do we not want to listen to them, we seldom want to be around them at all. We even try to avoid that kind of person at a party who is laughing so loud it almost hurts our ears, or the preacher that shouts at us, even though she or he may not be saying anything accusatory. The mere fact that they are shouting at us can be offensive and cause us to close our ears. How often do we ourselves 
raise our voice to try and make a point in a conversation or argument. We may not think that we're being obnoxious, but the other person starts to shut down or walk away. Maybe they just start shouting back, at which point the conversation is no longer a conversation because no one is listening at all. So I ask you this question in all seriousness. Why do we think that we need God to shout at us to make his words understood? Why do we believe that the message that we are receiving from our Creator isn't valid unless God raises a divine voice to us? Could it possibly be that we're not listening for God's whisper in our ears? Perhaps we're just too busy to pay attention to God's whisper, or, or that we believe that a loud, booming voice is more than of an intention-getter and validation that God is speaking to us. Here's a little secret that I will pass along to you. If you hear nothing else in this sermon, please burn this one into your brain. Satan can shout too. The third message in this series on Elijah was entitled, We Speak, God Listens. In that message, we talked about Elijah and how he was talking to God, praising his creator and also declaring Elijah's position as God's servant. The event surrounding this prayer was the raising of the widow's son from the dead after the young man had died from an illness. Today we're going to reverse that dynamic. Today we are focused on those moments when God speaks, we listen. How do we shut out the cacophonous rantings of a world gone mad in order to hear God speaking to us? What can Elijah teach us about this? When we left our story last week, we were talking about Elijah and as he was on the run from the army of Jezebel and had taken a respite in the desert under a broom bush, telling God that he was too tired to go on and just wanted to die. Well, instead of letting him die, God sent an angel to minister to him, providing with food and drink and encouraging him to rest. And when he got up, he traveled 40 days to Mount Orb, the mountain of God. It is at this point that we resume our story. <clears throat> there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now we've talked before about this and the different message, but it is important an important part of Elijah's journey. He spends the night in a cave at the top of Mount Horeb where he's sleeping. God is starting to instill in a message into him. There is no shouting. As a matter of fact, God has removed Elijah from any distractions of the world. Here, in this cave at the top of Mount Horeb, there is no army of Jezebel to draw his attention and focus away from God. He's able to rest without worry. Because his rest is deep and restful, we can hear the whispers and utterances of God in his mind and his soul. What does that tell us? You know, centuries later, we find these particular words in the sixth chapter of Matthew that are spoken by Jesus. But when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. <clears throat> Can you see the connection here? 
when we remove the distractions of life from our one-on-one -on -one time with God, we can hear the whisper. We can begin to understand that God is what try, God is trying to say to us. We can be in conversation with God. Satan is always trying to distract us by shouting in one ear while God is whispering in the other. And when we close out the, the noise of the world created by Satan, there is no question as to the message being whispered to us by God. God asked Elijah, What are you doing here, Elijah? But Elijah still hasn't shut out the world around him. He is still fixated on the events that have led to this cave. God removed the distractions, but Elijah is clinging to them. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. For some reason, Elijah seems to think that God needs a blow-by-blow -blow description of everything that has happened. He just can't seem to let go. He can't seem to stop his mind from racing. He can't seem to understand that God wants his full attention. God wants him to step back, take a breath, and listen to the whispers. Listen to us. I'm a good Christian, Lord, and I've been working so hard to forward your kingdom. I truly want to be your hands and feet in this world. I'm trying so hard. But people are so angry and tired right now. We have this COVID thing going on, and I don't trust the government, and we have this, this border crisis going on, and there are riots, and civilian and police officers like are dying, and, and no one wants to take responsibility. There's so much noise and shouting going on, God, and now Russia is invading the Ukraine, and I am worried about the people there as well as our own military and their families. These are such scary and trying Times, God. God says, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. God is telling Elijah that our Creator is in control. Change the focus of your mind, Elijah. Get ready to meet your God. As important as all those things are that are going on, none of them are as important as your time here with God and the message that God is trying to get you to listen to. Focus on the now. Focus on being in the presence of God. You let me, the creator of all that is, take care of all that other stuff. Stop. Look right here at me. I'm talking to you. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. I want you to understand that this is a way for God to help Elijah clear his mind. It is difficult to think about the army of Jezebel when the wind is ripping boulders from the side of the mountain around you. It is hard to concentrate on the problems with the Israelites when you're standing in the middle of an earthquake. It is so very difficult to let the voice of day, Satan and the news of the world distract you when you're afraid of being consumed in a fire. God knows how to grab our attention and to get us concentrating on our Creator's words. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, pulled back his cloak over his face and 
and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Once God had Elijah's full attention, only then did he whisper in his ear plain enough to be understood. It is at this moment that Elijah humbles himself, covers his face, and goes to meet his maker at the mouth of the cave. Awe and fear can do that to us. We might think that all these distractions around us are of such significant proportions that we need our, that they need our immediate attention. And then God calls us into the presence of the creator of the universe. And we realize that just how small and insignificant our problems really are. At a time when we are told to duck and cover, crawl under our desks, hide in our basements, live in fear of the events happening around us, God calls us into his presence, shows us the expanse of creation, all to remind us that God is in charge, and it is we who have forgotten that. What is God asking? What is God saying to us? What are you doing here, Elijah? What are we doing here? Cowering under our desks? Are we the children of the creator of the universe? Our God has welcomed us into his presence. Our God loves us so much he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we could experience this moment in the presence of our creator. What are we doing here? Worrying about things that we can't control when there's so much to be done. Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah sounds like a broken record, popping back into the same mindset over and over and over again. He's standing in the very presence of God, and he still can't seem to let go. We have the same problem. We are standing strong in our faith. We pray, we sing, we preach, we teach. We witness, we serve, we listen intently. But we can't or won't. Shut out the noise. That is because we are trying to shut out the noise rather than asking God to shut out the noise. There are even some of us that welcome that noise because we don't want to have to face our maker and take on the responsibilities that God has for us. We use the noise as an excuse. Pardon me, God. I appreciate you showing up for me, but you know, this problem over here, well, it's so much more important than talking to you right now. And we put the creator of the universe on hold while we try to fix a problem that he already has a handle on. A problem that keeps us from doing what he intends for us to do. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. <laughs> now, wait a minute, preacher. What are you telling us here? What I'm telling you is this, that in spite of everything else going on around us, God has things for us to do. And while we may not think the things that he is asking of us are near as important as the huge problems that we see occurring around us. It is God that knows what needs to be done, and we are the tools that he uses to accomplish his work. 
God may not need for us to face Jezebel's army, but he may need for us to anoint a king, feed the poor, clothe the naked, give shelter to the homeless, visit the sick. I want us all to think about that this week as we allow God to whisper into our souls and tell us where we can best serve. Don't be paralyzed by the distractions around us. Instead, let us stand humbly, faces covered in the presence of our Creator, and listen to the whispers of God. God bless you all. Amen.